Hello YouTube, this is Cynical Who, I'm Max, this is a very impromptu, improvised video, I haven't written a script for this, because basically I've decided that I hate myself. I hate myself so much that I'm going to subject myself to this episode twice upon a time, okay. Um, in all seriousness, obviously this month is the month of Christmas, the most wonderful time of the year, allegedly. Um, but obviously this year is a bit different because it can't come soon enough. I hope wherever you are, you're having a very good time. And essentially, I was going to do a video, and I'm still probably going to do this video, where I run through all the Christmas specials. And as part of that, I've been doing very intense research. As part of that intense research, I watched this Christmas special for the first time in full since its original broadcast. And... I ended up having so much to say about it, I felt, you know what, stuff it. I will just run through things that I think are particularly relevant about this episode. Essentially, I watched this on its original broadcast. We had the whole family around Christmas Day. They wouldn't shut up while it was on, and I was trying to listen. But, you know, we watched it, and I did watch various bits of it afterwards. But I never watched it in full until now, but I was aware that... It's got a very weird reputation, hasn't it? Because I've seen a lot of people praise this because it's, you know, brilliant emotion, nostalgic. But I've seen a lot of people say that this is crap. Um, and looking at the IMDb reviews, the people who are positive can't really... Uh, I mean, not to dig those people. If you like it, then that's very good. But, you know, they, they tend to say that it's good because of nostalgia and that sort of thing and because it was lovely and bittersweet and emotional um my relationships my relationship with this is a bit more complicated because i've never been able to watch time twice upon a time or even think of the special without thinking of one very significant bit of context which is that this Christmas special was not originally supposed to happen. Um, the original plan was, in case you don't know, the plan was Peter Capaldi and Stephen Moffat were going to leave with the Series 10 finale, The Doctor Fools. But Chris Chibnall decided he didn't want to start his tenure as showrunner with a Christmas special, um, for whatever reason. Um and so Stephen Moffat was afraid that there would be quite a long gap between series 10 and series 11. And he was also worried about um, losing the Christmas Day slot, which is quite lucrative and significant. So he decided to rewrite the end of the Doctor Falls at the last minute and write the Christmas special. Um, you know, I can understand Moffat's reasons. I can understand Chibnall's reasons because... You know, he would have had his plan. I'm not interested in my emails. Just buzz off. So this sharing screen is going so well. I don't want... Oh, God. How do I get... <laughs> See, this is what happens when you do impromptu shit. And you don't plan this. I tried doing this the other day with Netflix. And it was only when I shared the screen I realised that it had an automatic thing where it blanks the screen. So you can't pirate the thing. Luckily, iPlayer is not as sophisticated. Anyway... So, yeah, Chibnall didn't want to write a Christmas special, probably because he had his own plans and it would have interfered too much. So Moffat decides to write a Christmas special. Because if we didn't have a Christmas special, let's face it, the fandom would have moaned about the long gap. Um, so instead of irritating the fans that way, Moffat decides to irritate them, you know, in a completely different way by giving them stuff to argue over, which is better than having no stuff to argue over, to be honest. Um, so... Because it's very last minute, because Moffat had had all these plans and then decided to change them very late in the game, I think the cliffhanger to the Doctor Falls was shot about two weeks before the episode went out, if memory serves, and the pre-titles to World Enough in Time as well as part of that. Um, yeah, and the script for Twice Upon a Time is made up of recycled ideas. Um, I don't know if that really comes across on screen, but um, you have, like, the Christmas arms, this is something Moffat had always wanted to do in a Christmas special, but he was always kind of umming and ahhing about it because he wasn't quite sure if it would fit or be appropriate for a Christmas special or for Doctor Who. Um, and he liked the idea of the first Doctor seeing his future shelf. Future shelf? 
Um, did they have shelves in the TARDIS? But no, his future self um, and being quite bemused. That was something Peter Capaldi had mentioned at a convention and Moffat likes the idea and decides to nick it. So that was World War One. So it's, yeah, it's made up of loose ends, essentially, that Moffat had kind of, yeah, unused ideas from his years as showrunner. Um, the only thing is these are, you know, these recycled ideas don't really meld together. Um, but I think we'll get to general thoughts. Let's just run through this scene by scene. So obviously, the cliffhanger to the Doctor Falls with the first Doctor showing up is very good cliffhanger. Um, you know, it works in the Doctor Falls, in my view. And then we have this previously on Doctor Who. I like how it starts with just a blank screen previously on Doctor Who. And then it ends up being a recap for the 10th planet. Very, yeah. For casual viewers, this would have been very weird. Um, But there are things I like. I like how... I mean, the Cybermen are shown in it. Not, you know, you don't really need to know about that for the episode. But it's a nice little continuity then because, of course, they were in the previous story. Um, But, of course, there's this lovely visual effect. I'm probably not going to be able to do it entirely. With the, yeah... So it goes from 4 by 3 black and white to David Browley, who I think does a brilliant job in the part. Yeah, very seamless transmission, transition rather. I can't pronounce things tonight. You know, words as they're actually called. Um, But yeah, Um, Ben Pickles is his real name, but he was known only as John Smith at that time. That was his pseudonym. And he does some good visual effects for this, I'll say that. Um, Yeah. So this is all just pointless recap of Tenth Planet. Apparently they shot a great deal more of this. So he just wanders off. Um, and then you have a caption. I mean, I quite like when you have captions that start films. But of course it's tell, don't show. And then we have a reprise of the cliffhanger. I will say right now... As much as I love Capaldi, and he is one of my, you know, for me, he is the Doctor, and I've talked about this in the Series 9 review. A lot of what he's given to do is slightly too comical, but he does it really well. But I think this episode, his portrayal is... This is the only episode where I found his portrayal of the Doctor quite annoying, because he just overhams it quite a lot, I think. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't want to disrespect Capaldi because, as I say, I think he's a great doctor. But I can't really blame him, to be honest, because, of course, this is his last throw of the dice as the doctor. And if you believe the rumours, apparently he might have been forced out, maybe, but that's only a rumour. Um, so who can blame him for just having a bit of fun with the role? So, yeah, they um, both have decided to refuse to regenerate. Capaldi, at this point, mentions that um, he doesn't remember this happening. Um, Which, yeah, is... I mean, acknowledging a continuity error doesn't make it not a continuity error, if that makes sense. But, yeah, I don't know if that made sense. It's it's too late. I don't care. Um, So, yeah, they just... They... Oh, God, they're talking for quite a long time, aren't they? For, like two three minutes and then suddenly time stops for reasons and there's snowflakes and then mark gatus shows up out of nowhere and then yeah the target sequence about five minutes in which always used to irritate me that i i quite like nowadays we have a bit of balance between the title sequence that sometimes it shows up before the start of the thing but sometimes it shows up Couple of minutes in. I don't like these pre-titles being like eight minutes long as they have been in the past. It, I mean, series twelve. To be fair, it does feel a bit abrupt because the titles are clearly not designed to have that, you know, pre-title sequence before. But um, you know, I like that we have a balance. We don't feel like we have to have pre-title sequences because they feel quite anachronistic. Um, this is a bit where the music of Murray Gold is particularly effective. Now, this is one of the saving graces, I think, of Twice Upon a Time, is the um, music, which I struck me as very interesting at the time. Um, Murray Gold, of course, this is his last episode as composer. We didn't know it, but we kind of had a feeling because his score is very nostalgic in keeping with, you know, the nostalgic feelers of this episode. Um, there are loads of 
themes that have been... A lot of it, I don't think... I might be wrong, but not a lot of it really sounds that new. Um, a lot of it really is just stuff that has been composed in the past. Um, and a lot of it we hadn't heard for years, like the Ninth Doctor's theme, that sort of thing. And um, Val de Kem, which plays for the Tenth Doctor's regeneration, you hear that when the First Doctor regenerates near the end. You know, these old cues that work partly because they're our childhood, but, you know, they're still good cues that really, it's a testament to the strength of the cues they were written for other purposes but they work beautifully here especially with this shot here you have the um i one of the 12th doctor's cues i think the start of a good man or whatever it was i'm not an expert on all the different cues but so yeah we start going into eep i do think the world war one and christmas armistice was used very well here um Something I did notice, this scene is lovely with Mark Gatiss. I think Mark Gatiss is brilliant in this. This is the thing about Twice Upon a Time. I won't say it's shit because there's enough good individual moments to make it worthwhile. As with any shit episode of Doctor Who. Um, and this is a very good example, this scene. Um, where basically Mark Gatiss says, you know, the only reason I'd kill the German soldier, played by fellow writer Toby Whithouse, who I, yeah, I like his writing. Uh, it's nice that they gave him a small cameo here. Um, yeah, the only reason I'd kill you is self-defense, self but you may kill me in self-defense. Um, yeah, he's basically, he doesn't know if the German soldier has intentions to kill him. Um, something I did notice, I don't know if this was very obvious, but when I watched this in Netflix, you actually have English subtitles. If you turn on the subtitles, you get English translation subtitles for what the German soldier is saying. And what the German soldier is saying is actually very similar to what Mark Gates is saying. He's pointing the gun at Mark, but he goes, no, please don't kill me. I don't want to hurt you. Put the gun down. But of course, neither of them can understand each other. So they keep the guns poised because they have no reason to assume that the other isn't going to kill them, which I think is, yeah... I find that very sad and poignant. And it's a great commentary on war as well. Um, how, you know, so often these wars start and are fought and people persist in fighting these, you know, these bloodthirsty wars because of simple mere misunderstandings rather than conquest for power. Um, oh, I just like that scene. Um, but, you know, I'm trying analysis. It's not going very well here. It's not as deep as I hoped it would be. But um, we get into a very good bit here. Um, Leftwood Shearer is just about to die. Obviously, I've spoiled it. Um, yeah, so time suddenly stops. And there's a bit where I just fall asleep because it just feels like it's trying to build tension, but it just feels too long. Yeah, there was a rumour that apparently the special was 90 minutes originally. Um, whether or not that rumour is true, I can't verify. But um, yeah, I can't imagine it. And then a glass lady appears out of nowhere. And then apparently there's a timeline error. Timeline error. And this is clarified later on. Basically, the reason the soldier ends up you know, in the South Pole in whatever year the 10th planet is set as opposed to being at Eep in 1914, the reason he sent falls in time is because of a timeline error because the Doctors refused to regenerate. And, yeah, I just... Yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, it's somewhat contrived and coincidental, but hey-ho, I'm not exactly clever for pointing that out, am I? Um, so he ends up back in time. He's rightly... Uh, confused and shit, and yeah, David Bradley looking very stern there. I'm bored of this already. Um, yeah, and you have this scene that the only significant thing I have to say about the scene is it was shown in advance for children in need, and yeah. I like how the first Doctor amaze, you know, the amazement of the first Doctor is contrapuntal with the amazement of Lethbridge-Stewart. I like 
the whole sort of Lethbridge Stewart's horrific realization that actually this isn't the Great War, this is just World War One. I. I like Capaldi's delivery of the line "I am younger." What I don't like is how it. It's like um, basically the first Doctor is like, "I have no idea who you are" for the first few minutes, and then like we're only sort of ten minutes in, and when was it? Um, yeah, here. Oh, yeah, the, the, the very nice shot of Mark Gatiss holding a Betamax or VHS tape. I like VHS. Um, yeah, anyone remember VHS from their childhood? Yeah, so just 10 minutes in, you know, first Doctor is like, you can't possibly meet. And then Peter Capaldi just waves his hand about for a bit. And um, first Doctor is like, oh, yeah, you are me. It's a bit like Victory of the Daleks, where we had this great thing where you know are the iron signs good or evil and a good concept you know for building mystery and it, yeah just wasted 10 minutes in um or 15 minutes or whatever and then well they're on the TARDIS for like f three more minutes oh yeah and the uh, first doctor is a raven misogynist um i won't say anything more on the matter because enough blood has been spilled metaphorically speaking i hope on the interwebs about that matter. Um, but yeah, the first Doctor was never a misogynist. I don't mind it first couple of times. Um, but yeah, I think the joke is laboured a bit too much. Although Stu Bagful might have a point when Moffat was never that interested in the first Doctor. The first Doctor doesn't really have any agency. He's just here as a companion, really. The idea of the 12th Doctor meeting the first Doctor and the first Doctor seeing what he becomes... Is a good idea, but it's not one that can sustain a 60-hour Christmas special. What, 60-hour? Oh, God, I hope not. But a 60-minute Christmas special. And it certainly it doesn't really mix very well with the World War One subplot and the testimony subplot. And then... Uh, yeah, so I'll fast forward a couple of things. Yeah, Bill Potts shows up for no reason. I just think, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't undermine her departure in the Doctor Falls, which I think was a lovely poetic full circle ending, her being reunited with Heather. Although, yeah, we kind of wonder where Heather is. That's not really very well explained, I thought. Um, was explained in the best of days pretty well, because I liked the line... Um, yeah, about proving that she was always right or whatever it was. You know, I don't think it undermines it too much, but it certainly doesn't add anything. Um, and it just wasn't particularly surprising. And then every conversation with Bill and the 12th Doctor is basically like, um, I'm, I'm back, Doctor, I'm back. And the Doctor is like, no, you're not. You're not real. You're not Bill Potts. No, but I am real. You know, what is a person but a bunch of memories? You know, I'm my memories, so I am Bill. And, um, oh, yeah, um, I, I, I miss travelling with you, Bill. Yeah, I miss travelling with you too. Um, sorry, you're not Bill, you're not real. And repeat on an endless loop until the apocalypse and the crack of doom and doomsday and all that lovely jazz. You know, just every conversation is just, oh, it gets grating and it's just not very, yeah, the mis I can never really get embedded in the mystery that way. Yeah, so, um. Yeah, I don't like the whole sort of monocle and sonic sunglasses. It's just Capaldi having it again. Or... Yeah, and this bit as well really irritated me. We're skipping forward. Yeah, this is a point where, you know, William Hartnell, the first Doctor is just really there as a companion, kind of suggests a couple of things, but it's just... Yeah, he doesn't have a lot of agency, and he's kind of wasted in this... He feels somewhat redundant. And then you have this kind of flashback thing. Oh, nostalgia. So therefore, it's really good. And, you know, the first Doctor sees his future. But then it's kind of just glossed over. And it's just, oh, it's time to escape. Do what I do when I do it. And there's not, there's never a conversation later on where the first Doctor is like, this is who I become. There's just, you know, there's no argument or tension or conflict between him and the 12th Doctor over all that. It's just a funny, oh, to be fair, they cut out all the jokes. Which I suppose, you know, if it was played straight, it would have been, a, you know, true that it's a selective representation. That, you know, the Doctor of War is not all the Doctor is. You know, there are jokes and there is good done. But, you know, it's not really, like I say, it's glossed over. And... 
you know, the idea is interesting, but it's just not really explored at all here. The first Doctor is just kind of there. I do, you know, one of my key memories of Twice Upon a Time, although I didn't watch this, was I did watch the um, Five Who fans review that Billy Treacy did. And he made the point that, you know, nothing really changes. You could edit the regeneration onto the end of the Doctor Falls and, you know, it'd be clear that it'd been edited. But you don't lose anything from a story point of view. And he is right, to be fair. Um, but, hey... You know, who fans can't moan, can they? And we're back in the first Doctor's TARDIS, and, you know, it's very nice, faithful redesign. And a really, um, yeah, William Hartnell wearing Sonic sunglasses, because apparently that's funny. Things. Oh, God, yeah, the ladies made of glass thing, which I still don't get. Um, I've tried, yeah. I mean, I did laugh at Bill's comeback that she'd also had experience of the fairer sex. You know, that made me laugh on first transmission. But it doesn't make me laugh now. It's just, yeah, it goes on too long. And we're like 26 minutes in to a 16-minute special. And uh, it's just... It did people talking and not a lot happening. Oh, yeah, and we're now on Villain Guard. Which I do like. Um, it's basically Stephen Moffat deciding, as this is my last episode, just going to wipe my screen clean. I'm going to bring it full circle. I'm going to go to a place that I mentioned in my first story. This is something that he had tried with the Husbands of River Song. That was his first final story. Originally, that was going to be the last story that he wrote. But he decided to stay on because Chibnall was busy with um, that drama theme, Broadchurch. And in that, of course, you have the scene in Towers of Drillium. Um, which is full circle back to Silence in the Library, which was the, you know, Moffat considers that his kind of mission statement as showrunner of Doctor Who, and that was the start of all his plot arcs with Riverson, and, you know, that was the story that came out when Moffat had just been announced as taking over from Davis as showrunner. Um, you know, and that full circle thing I thought was quite nice with the husband of Riverson. Um, we'll talk more about that in the general video. Because it had emotional weight, you knew that Derillium, because of Silence in the Library, it had been mentioned, you knew that Derillium was going to be the place where the Doctor sees Riverson for the last time, knowing of Riverson's ultimate fate. You know, so there was that emotional connotation there. The only thing with Villengard, nice though it is to, you know, actually see Villengard for the first time, it was just a throwaway reference in The Doctor Dances or whatever. You know, there was there isn't that same emotional weight. It's just a place where there was once a sonic gun factory that the Doctor blew up. And that's it. There's no... It's not associated with any dramatic, you know, pivotal moment in his life. So, you know, it doesn't work quite as well. But, you know, it is nice to see it, even though I don't really remember it being... You know, it's described here as one of the biggest databases, although I suppose Rusty is the database thinking about it now. But it's... You know, it's it doesn't really bear any resemblance to the villain guard that's been described in the past, which was, you know, place where sonic guns were made. There's no mention of sonic guns here at all. Not that it's really relevant, but not that, you know, there's been a lot of irrelevant stuff like the Mondasian Cybermen that featured here. Um, you know, and this is non-appealing to casual viewers as it is, so you might as well have mentioned the sonic guns just to make sure. And then Jolly Good Smack Bottom... Um, yeah. Th this is what I mean about every conversation between the 12th Doctor and Bill just being, I am real. No, you're not. I am real. No, I'm not. Yes, I'm real because memories. I am memories. And yeah, just what was the point if every conversation was going to be like... Yeah. And yeah, five Doctors throw back. And a lovely scene with Mark Gates sort of taking stock and... Yeah, just, like I say, the the first Doctor is just there and there's no tension. He doesn't really ponder what he's becoming. But, yeah, Dalek Mutant as well attacks um, the soldier for no reason other than just to get him out of the way. Um, and then, oh yeah, the brilliant scene of Mark Gatiss, whose acting performance is great in this. Uh... 
more villain god. Oh yeah, and we get the Dalek. Um, yeah, which is yeah. I suppose in I do like Into the Dalek, but I'm not sure it was really necessary to have that sequel. But I suppose you know if you need a database, it's explained here as being yeah. I mean, I was thinking, you know, why does he go to a Dalek? database of all databases but apparently it's the biggest database it's it's explained in the dialogue so that's a stupid concern of me to have and i do like the line about daleks getting naked for the doctor but and oh yeah i do love this scene where um i've always loved the scene where the first doctor explains why he ran away and sort of pondering why good always prevails over evil and of course you hear the ninth doctor's theme in the background um, like I say, that theme hadn't been heard for years, so that was, yeah, really good music, yeah, really effective from Murray Gold, um, and, yeah, so we find out that Testimony is just extracting people from the end of their lives, so, you know, and putting their memories in glass bodies, and the Doctor says, it's not an evil plan, well, I mean, that depends what way you look at it, it does sound a bit Black Mirror, to be honest, and it does, you know, that th there could be negative consequences of it. I mean, you know, look what happened with Tranquil Repose. Like that guy said, if you bring the dead back, then A, they're going to be in competition with those who took over power from them. I mean, they'd be glass bodies, so you wouldn't have, like, um, you know, there'd still be enough food to go around and resources and stuff, but, you, you know, overpopulation and, you know, I, I don't know. Is it really not an evil plan? It's all I'm saying. And yes, we have the confirmation that Bill Potts is, after all, a glass lady, which just seems slightly hollow because it's just been that constant to and fro, and we've kind of suspected it. Oh, yes. I knew her throwback is nice enough, I suppose. All the throwbacks could have worked better if they were more like that, sort of background throwbacks that, you know, you would spot if you were a fan, but if you're a casual viewer, they still... But I suppose it was fair enough for a show that was 12 years old. Like I said in the Series 9 review, this show was 12 years old. You know, fair enough to reward the fans, especially at this pivotal moment with the show changing. Um... So I really wish I would have more Harbo Holmes and style analysis to say about this. Yeah, and we have this bit about the timeline error. It's explained, and like I said, uh, it makes no sense. But I do love this scene with the um, the Christmas armistice. Feels like a really nice emotional ending to um, the soldier. And I don't feel cheated for once that he doesn't die because the Moffat characters always, you know, it's like their death is threatened, but then they always come back. But yeah, it's nice. And yeah, and of course that was a true thing that really happened. They stopped fighting for one Christmas. Of course they resumed fighting after that, but um which makes it all the more poignant. Yeah. Today's magic word is poignant. Drink every time I say that. This sequence is actually quite long, but still quite emotional. And then um, yeah, the first doctor having not really said a lot about who he becomes although there is a nice bit you know where he says what the doctor of war really means i did like that bit of dialogue so this is the thing that there are bits of twice upon a time i do like but there are i would say it's certainly i don't know yeah he takes a walk and then nice use of music here and then you have a really nice transition back into four by three direct and to the point and yet, and Bill again, and um, you know what the sad, the hardest part of knowing you was saying goodbye. That's more Moffat talking than the character, but hey ho. And yeah, Clara shows up for no reason. Um, if I can get this on. Yeah, there you go. I mean, I wasn't. It does seem a bit pointless, but the big problem with this scene is not so much it's. Pointless. I mean, Rachel Talley, the director, has argued that it's not pointless because the thing is, this Christmas special was all about memories. I will say, by the way, great direction from Talley because I do think she elevated. Um, you know, her direction is pretty good. But um, 
Yeah, the problem with this scene for me is it's very obvious that Jenna Coleman and Peter Capaldi were not in the same room. And because of conflicting schedules and Jenna Coleman being very busy with Victoria, the drama that ITV do, the period drama, um, she couldn't be there at the time of shooting. She had to be there towards the end just acting to a tennis ball. And it's blinding. It's very obvious. Um Obviously, I didn't need to tell you that. And it's just, you know, that you can tell they're acting to tennis balls, which kind of undermines, really, the scene. Although it does add a certain dreamlike quality to Clara's presence. And then Nardole shows up. I mean, it's all right. Um, yeah, I like Matt Lucas. And I like his delivery of the line, don't die, because if you do, I think everyone in the universe might just go cold. That was nice. Especially in the line about invisible hair. Apparently, Nardole's hair is actually purple. Which I like that as well. Shame he didn't mention that in the thing. But, um, yeah. To be honest, I prefer the end of time's 20 minute sequence at the end. And I know that's a controversial opinion because a lot of people don't like it. But it just felt more special, really. And more like the sort of proper you know yes it's self-indulgent but this was five years this was the biggest show on tv coming to the end of an era you know i can forgive it for being self-indulgent and this was the last time we were going to see a lot of these characters and to be honest i kind of hope it is the last time because it wrapped up the story pretty well obviously you know certain characters have come back such as captain jack but uh i'm looking forward to revolution though um and yeah, now Peter Capaldi's final speech, I don't mind. I think it's okay. Yeah, it has grown on me. Um, but, you know, the speech isn't the problem. What is the problem is the rest of the, off, from the speech, I think it goes downhill. The regeneration and the actual Jodie's first scene, there we go, is a little bit... <laughs> I was underwhelmed at the time and it still underwhelms me now because it's just a rip-off of The End of Time Part 2. And even I came up with an original idea on the night, which is basically Jodie wakes up in her new clothes. I was, you know, it, the scene is actually quite nice with the silence, the tension of silence up until her saying, oh, brilliant, her one solitary line and then just being chucked out the TARDIS blown up for no good reason, which was... Dramatic, you know, my mouth was open when it happened in the end of time part two because it was unprecedented having explosions that big and the whole set being wiped to shreds. You know, that felt, you know, that was genuinely unexpected. But here it just feels like, meh. You know, it feels like, oh, you know, we've got to get rid of this TARDIS set just for the sake of it. So how can we get rid of it? Yeah, just blow it up. And yeah. It's just better, the blowing up the TARDIS was just better executed in the end of time, I think, because because it was unprecedented and it tied in well with our emotions, because it was my first regeneration as well. Um, so yeah, the TARDIS blows up and then Jodie just has, you know, my idea for Jodie's regeneration, I kind of imagined her basically going, looking in the mirror and going, oh God, no. I'm still not Ginger, which obviously is an old joke, but at least it would kind of be, you know, give her more stuff to do and would kind of circumvent, you know, and show that the gender isn't important. And it would actually maybe make some effort to kind of persuade the naysayers. But Jodie doesn't do anything. And I suppose it leaves you wanting more, which is probably what Chibnall was going for. But given, you know, this was all we got for like 10 months, it's like she just says, oh, brilliant smiles and then just falls out could we not have had something more like she tries to dye her hair ginger and then just accidentally sprays it the wrong way because she's still a bit delirious following the regeneration and then just ends up spraying the TARDIS and then the toxic chemicals cause it to blow up or something I will say yeah the, the sequence is elevated by Rachel Talley's direction and Murray Gold's music even though it's reused um but yeah, it's just, it's not great. And I don't want to watch the next episode because it's getting rather late. And my battery's running out. So I'm going to plug this in. And then, yeah, sum up twice upon a time. So to quote the day today, in summary then, breezes.
and that's all the weather. Um, but yeah, I did have more detailed notes, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen, and then I will... New screen recording... Oh no, I don't want to stop that. Stop that. And then I want to get my notes up so I can read this. Yeah, so I have quite a lot of notes. So I'm just going to read this. So twice upon a time, great score for Murray Gold. And it isn't bad, I suppose. A few lovely moments, such as the armistice, the first Doctor wondering why good always wins. But it just feels a bit workmanlike and inconsequential, almost as though Moffat had to cobble something together at the last minute to cover for Chibnall refusing to write a Christmas special. Which, of course, he did. As I say, Chibnall probably had very good reasons. But, you know, you can just tell that it wasn't the original plan. And also, things as well, I think Capaldi deserved a lot better, really, with his regeneration story. The problem is, having the regeneration so drawn out, in The Doctor Falls, the reason why he regenerates is not particularly clear. Is it because he gets electrocuted by the Cybermen, or is it that final being shot near the end? You know, that wasn't really... Or is it just he's getting old? It's not really made particularly clear, because there's, like, two or three possible reasons for his regeneration in that story. But at least have him regenerate... You know, I think this story really proved. Maybe it wasn't obvious at the time, and maybe it was trying. Out, it was worth trying out. But this story really proved that it's not a good idea to have him, re, you know, injured, mortally wounded in one story, and then have him regenerate in the next story. Especially if there's like, what was it, like six months between these episodes? You know, it just doesn't work. Yeah, 20 minutes between in the end of time, I think, works, as I said earlier. And I still stand by that. But, yeah, not a whole episode. Because it's just, um, he never, you never get any indication that this is a character on his last legs. He's not, you know, he's not even, he doesn't play it like an ill person. That's the thing. But, you know, it says in the script that he feels more energetic. You know, that's normal part of regeneration. But you don't get the sense that this is a character that's about to change his face and regenerate he just plays it pretty normally but i feel like i'm being too harsh on compounded because i do like him as a doctor but yeah world war one utilized very well but it's like it is like two specials fighting each other it's like action romp which is the whole testimony thing and getting out versus contemplative oh i can't pronounce words contemplative look back at the show's past and the first doctor subplot the world war one subplot the testimony subplot you've got three different plots that don't mix that well and it is a bodge script made up of recycled old ideas capaldi's regeneration drawn out unnecessarily he deserves so much better like say the doctor falls that should have been his last story you should have stuck to that plan even if it meant like 15 months between stories um but yeah, lots of in-jokes that may be lost on some viewers. Very perfunctory writing at times, such as the whole timeline error. So yeah, it did leave me a bit cold. But do I? would I recommend it? Yeah, there's, well... It's certainly the weakest Christmas special, but there's a lot of good moments in it. I'm sorry about this light in the background. It's not ideal lighting, but it's 10 o'clock in the evening and the lights here are shit. But yeah, I just, there are a few good moments. So there, that's my insight on Twice Upon a Time. After having not watched it in full for three years, I watched it again the other day. And yeah, I mean, Oliver hates it and was going to do his own review where he just shouted down the mic about how crap it was. And I don't think it's outright shit. You know, there are enough, there's enough good elements of it to make me think, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I, I don't blame Moffat for it because it's just, it was something he wrote because he felt he had to. As a, as a way of kind of just making sure we still had Christmas specials. And of course, you know, we still have Christmas specials now, don't we? But yeah. I Yeah. Um, the Capaldi era and the Moffat era could have ended so much better. The way the Davis era ended was a lot better than this, I think. So I wish I could be more positive about it, but... Um, but yeah... I know this video has probably been quite long. Sorry about that. 
Um, but I will be more positive in the general Christmas video, which will be coming soon, where I've been watching all the Christmas specials, and I will be more positive about the Moffat Christmas specials, I think. Because at the time of recording this, I've watched all the Moffat specials, but I haven't seen the RTD specials because I kind of watched them too much as a kid and now it's a bit of an awkward experience because they're not really that fresh having watched them so often. I might get a chance to, I might persevere and watch them in the next few days ready for the review, which is going to run through all, certainly the specials from 2005 to 2017 and maybe Resolution as well. So I look forward to that. We're also working on a skit for Christmas as well. So look out for that. Stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.